Okay, good morning. Well, uh, first I want to thank Ajit and Bala and Arun for inviting me to this conference and I was a uh, conference to this school. And uh, I was very uh, happy to accept, even though it was a lot of work to prepare the lectures for several reasons. First, because uh, I'm really happy that the whole Indigo idea is moving forward. And I thought that, you know, if I can do a little bit to help the cause, um, this was the right chance to come and uh, help set up a community here. Um, or improve the community that is already here, I should say, because I see that there's so many of you I didn't expect. Uh, Ajith told me that there's like 15 postdocs, 15 graduate students, students and 15 undergrads more or less in this room, right? So um, I'll try to shoot somewhere in between in, in terms of the level of the lectures. Um, the other uh, motivation for me to uh, accept the invitation was that um, We've been thinking for a while with uh, Vitor Cardoso and Leonardo Gualtieri to write a book on black hole perturbation theory, and uh, we never do it <laughs> because there's just too much going on all the time in terms of research and so on. And so I thought that having a deadline would force me to sit down and write up these lecture notes in a tech file and uh, hand it out so you guys can check it and uh, find the errors and uh, help me to improve the lecture notes. So that's my... <laughs> more, you know, selfish goal for coming here. So um, when I was thinking about the way to pre I was asked to lecture on black hole perturbation theory. Um, and of course, the third big motivation that makes this all the more relevant is that gravitational waves have been detected. For almost 20 years now, I've been doing gravitational wave astronomy without data. But you guys are lucky because you got into the field when we actually have data. So, um, and one of the big surprises, and as I'm sure all of you know, was the fact that the first detection was from the merger of two very massive black holes for which the ring down part of the signal uh, is very well visible in the data. And uh, we expect that when uh, LIGO starts the second observation around, we're gonna see more of these things. And so now studying cold perturbations is not just a theoretical physics problem as it was at the time I started, but it's really a data analysis problem and one with important implications in terms of our ability to test general relativity and so on. And I'm sure that Satya will also say something about this because he has also been working on testing general relativity with ring down waves and, uh, and uh, this sort of stuff. So, um, let me explain a little bit how I decided to organize the lectures before we start. Uh, the idea is that doing black hole perturbation theory with pen and paper is very hard. So uh, these lectures are based on a previous um, uh, set of lectures that I gave in Germany, I think a couple of years ago. But at the time, I had maybe one hour and a half or something like that. And so I could cover much less material than what I will try to cover here first. And second, I had to focus on a very restricted set of topics. So uh, now I have more time, and so I can go more in depth on many of the topics that I covered back then. And so I significantly expanded the lecture notes that I prepared for the school in Germany. Basically, the school in Germany was something like chapters two and three of the lecture notes that I gave you. And now I expanded this with much more material. So the first chapter is going to be a general introduction to um, what black holes are, but I know that pretty much all the people in this room have already taken general relativity, so I will assume that you are familiar with the Einstein field equations, that you are familiar with the black hole solutions of general relativity, and I will just give you a very, very short overview of the solutions themselves. I will mostly try to motivate how black holes are an intrinsically general relativistic object, but then I will move on and I will start working on things like geodesics and perturbations. So today, uh, the material that I will cover should be relatively simple. Um, what I will say is I will try to set up some conventions and notation and so on, and then I will mostly focus today on chapter two, particles the motion of particles in uh, 
black hole spacetimes, and I will focus even more narrowly on uh, non-rotating black holes. I am pretty sure that almost all of you have seen this material in some shape or form before, but I want to cover it again because I will use it to uh, explain and motivate the physics behind black hole perturbation theory. And in particular, one of the core ideas behind this course will be the idea that particle motion and uh, wave uh, motion in uh, black hole spacetimes are very intimately related. So I will start by covering uh, particles. Then uh, the second problem that I will deal with is the problem of scalar perturbations. So I will assume that you have a black hole and that you induce a small perturbation on that black hole, which is described simply by a scalar field. And the scalar field will be linearized, so you can ignore the back reaction of the scalar field onto the metric. And this is a problem that is simple enough that I can still do it with pen and paper. But along the way, I will show you that when you try to treat more complicated problems, for example, when you go from perturbations induced by a scalar field to perturbations induced by an ele electromagnetic field, things get complicated enough that you don't want to use pen and paper anymore. So the idea of the lectures is that I'll do as much as I can on the blackboard, but I prepared a set of mathematical notebooks that ideally are solutions to problems that I will ask you to solve. Of course, you can cheat. That's up to you, okay? You can just look at the mathematical notebooks and the solutions are there. But I think you will learn much more if you actually look at the few examples that I will work for you. So for example, I work out the massive scalar wave equation on a black hole background step by step. And then I will ask you to do, the, to do the same for vector perturbations. I will tell you in general how to do it, but I think you will learn much more if you actually try to learn and make mistakes than if you look at the solution, okay? And then, uh, so once I have these prototype problems, for example, the scalar wave equation, I'll try to teach you how to solve the scalar wave equation. I will give you reminders on how you solve um, differential equations, and then I'll tell you how you can solve the particular wave equations that we will be interested in to uh, find the proper oscillation modes of a black hole. I'll teach you how to do it exactly and how to do it approximately. And one of the ways to do it approximately is to use the WKB approximation. The WKB appro approximation will be useful to build physical intuition because it will show you how these black hole perturbations induced by scattering of waves are related to the particle motion problem that I will consider today. And then, uh, of course, the scalar wave equation and the vector wave equation are just prototype problems. In the, I think in the th third day of the school, I will start working out the mathematics in, uh, I I'll ramp up the level, okay? So I'll work out vector and tensor spherical harmonics, which are the tools that you use to separate out the angular dependence of the perturbations for vector and tensor fields. I'll show you how to do it. And uh, then uh, I will actually work out the wave equations in the gravitational case. So I'll do classic derivations from the 1970s that you can find in the papers by Reggio Wheeler and Zerilli. And I'll work through them. And at that point, I will really need Mathematica or a, an algebraic uh, manipulation software, and you will see why, especially when we do a Zerilli equation. The polar case is complicated enough that you really don't want to do it with pen and paper. So all of this um, is sort of in preparation of the gravitational wave detection problem. So first, after I derive the gravitational perturbations, and so I show you how to compute gravitational radiation from uh, uh, perturbed black holes, I will work out a specific problem that was the first problem to be solved back in the 1970s. Well, probably the second. The first problem to be solved was the scattering of waves of a black hole. And that problem was solved by Bishweshwara, actually, in a famous Nature paper. I think it was in the late 60s. Uh, I'll work out that thing in a Mathematica notebook. Then I'll work out the problem of a particle falling into a black hole. So we will work out the source term, 
that describes the perturbation of a black hole induced by a particle. We will work out in detail the problem of the particle falling in and the radiation that comes out. And I'll show you that this relatively simple problem that can work out in three or four days describes very well the much more complicated problem of two comparable mass black holes coming together. So the last part of the lectures will be what does black hole perturbation theory teach us about the full problem, the one where you have two black holes coming together, and from the other perspective, what have we learned by studying black hole collisions in numerical relativity about the excitation of black hole quasi-normal modes uh, in perturbation theory. Okay, so these two aspects I will bring together and I will show you that perturbation theory is remarkably powerful. It allows you to understand most of the features of the comparable mass problem and these days it's also being used for uh, um, discovering new physics. And I'll give you a specific example. One of the problems that I will work out is the problem where you have a rotating black hole uh, and in the case of rotating black holes, if you induce perturbations, for example, scalar perturbations of the kind I was describing before, you discover that there is a remarkable phenomenon which is called superradiance. Superradiance is the possibility of extracting more energy than what you throw into a black hole. Now, one of the very active areas of research in physics these days is the search for dark matter. And one of the major candidates for dark matter are very light bosonic particles like the axions. Now, if these particles exist in nature, and there are rotating black holes out there, which now we have very strong evidence for, then uh, these massive particles would destabilize black holes. And they can either produce radiation that would be detectable by LIGO or LISA, or if they don't, we can use the non-observation of these gravitational waves to set bounds on the existence of these massive particles. So I'm going to show you how all of this follows from the basic perturbation theory problems that we are going to work out. The very last lecture or so will be dedicated to the actual uh, gravitational wave data analysis problem. So I'll show you how to compute signal to noise ratio for ring down signals. I'll show you how these signals can be used to estimate the parameters of the black hole produced from a merger. And um, I will describe um, actual research that I've been working on. We just had a paper accepted in physical review letters where we computed the rates of uh, ring down events that could be seen by advanced LIGO and other even more advanced detectors that are being conceived and uh, um, proposed in the United States and elsewhere, in particular um, what the LIGO community calls A+, and then Voyager, and then the Einstein telescope that Sati has been very, very heavily involved with. And I will uh, show you how current astrophysical models for black hole formation can be used to make predictions on how many events each of these detectors is going to be able to see and how many of those events can be used to test general relativity. Um, I think this is pretty much the outline of the course. Uh, do you have any questions at this point? The, uh, you have the PDF file, so I hope you actually try and read it before you show up for the lectures so you're prepared for what is going to hit you, okay? Um, and. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know. I'll try to go slowly as much as I can. That's why I'm doing everything, everything on the blackboard. Um, I think th this concludes the general introduction. In the afternoon, I'm going to work more with the Mathematica notebooks, but I'll try to do as much as I can on the blackboard during the morning. Any questions at this point before I actually begin? No? Okay, so I think we can actually lift the screen at this point, Ajith, if you can help me with that. And I'll just do pretty much everything I can, like I said, on the board. So um, the problem that I'll focus on today is the problem of particle motion in black hole space times. And uh, so,
Just to begin, let me, um, let me describe uh, black hole solutions and uh, let me tell you why uh, black holes are inherently a general relativistic object. If you open some of the popular books on black holes, for example, one of my favorites, Black Holes and Time Warps, the book by Kip Thorne, um, you will see that in the popular literature on black hole, one often mentions the fact that the black hole idea was first proposed at the Newtonian level by Reverend Mitchell back in the 1700s. I think it was 1784 or something like that. And the key idea is that if you uh, consider Newtonian physics, you can uh, write down that the escape velocity for a particle of mass m from a star of mass big M and radius r is given very simply by conservation of energy. And so if you write down this relation and you assume that there is an upper limit on the velocity with which anything can propagate in nature, so you throw in effectively special relativity before special relativity, you see that if there is an upper limit on V that we are going to call C, then the maximum escape velocity, that's a value of the critical radius um, that coincidentally happens to be just the Schwarzschild radius. Hmm? So this is a coincidence and it's nothing more than a coincidence for many reasons. Since most of you in this room are relativists, of course, this is a coordinate uh, statement. And uh, this is only true in the Schwarzschild metric in Schwarzschild coordinates. If I were to change coordinates, this, this wouldn't be true anymore. But even at a more uh, fundamental level, if you write down a relation like this, you have to check that you can actually build stars with a radius smaller than this if the dark stars that were originally proposed by Mitchell are to, are to exist. For example, we know in general relativity, and I'm sure you have seen it in your introductory general relativity courses, that in general relativity, even if you take the stiffest equation of state that you can conceive, the one where you take a star of constant density, let's say rho equal rho naught, you cannot build a star that is as compact as this because there is something called the Bukhdal limit that tells you that the, let me drop the G's and C's, okay? I'll set G and C equal to one. Uh -huh. We can do that. Um, the, the smallest radius uh, for a star in general relativity is nine over eight. And that is known as the Bukdal limit. So you, you may wonder whether this Newtonian statement um, is actually true when you try to build stars of, say, constant density, which is the most a compact star you, you are allowed to build. And it turns out that, in fact, this idea doesn't work. So uh, if you take a star of constant density, you will have that m over r is equal to OK? So just assume that you are in Newtonian gravity. You have a constant density star. The mass and the radius must be related in this way. So if you just look at this relation, you may say, well, Yes, I can build stars as compact as I want uh, by just tuning the density. But in fact, when you do this, you also have to take into account the uh, gravitational binding energy of the object. And so if you do that, the gravitational binding energy, of course, is given by something like minus integral of g m dm over r. And uh, you can rewrite this as minus integral of g over r times for a constant density star, the volume of the sphere times the uh, density of the star. And then the dm will just be 4 pi r squared rho naught dr, right? This is an integral we can all do. And if you do it, you will see that it is nothing but minus 16 over 15 uh, g pi squared rho naught squared r to the 5. Just collect the factors and you'll see that um, that's what it is. So uh, now the, the true 
compactness of the star will be what you will get if you forgot about the binding energy plus the binding energy contribution divided by R. And so if you do that, you, you get, um, well, I will have to rewrite this, 16 over 15 G pi squared over C squared rho naught squared R to the fourth, which you can rewrite as M over R times 1 minus 3 over 5 G over C squared M over R. Okay? So you have that your true gravitating mass is related to M over R of the star where you forgot to include the binding energy by this relation. And now, if you uh, go and minimize this in the regime where 2GM over C squared is larger than R, you will see that this is just a function called m over r x. This is a quadratic in m over r. <clears throat> Take a derivative, set it to zero. You will see that m over r is basically uh, something like 6 over 5. You plug it back in, and you get uh, um, 5 over 6. You plug it back in, and you get that this has to be smaller than 5 over 12 c squared over g. So if you actually do this problem carefully, which of course, 5 over 12 is smaller than 1 half. So you see that you cannot build constant density Newtonian stars that satisfy the Mitchell criterion. OK? So you need more gravity. And only in general relativity can you build objects that lie within their Schwarzschild radius because pressure self-gravitates? And so you can construct objects that are as compact as they need to be to create this you know, remarkable set of observational predictions, the fact that there are event horizons and so on and so forth. So Newtonian gravity alone won't do it for you. That was the message of this short calculation. Now. Um, you have all seen the Schwarzschild, yes. Four? Yes. So that's a very good question. It turns out that the outcome of collapse in Newtonian gravity depends very sensitively on the choice of equation of state that you make. I give a couple of references in the notes that you can look up. This is still, quite surprisingly, I have to say, an active area of research. People try to do Newtonian collapse using different equations of state. This was just a model problem to show you that static solutions with constant density cannot be as compact as in the naive Mitchell description. Okay? So that, that was the only goal of showing you this. But yeah, it's a very good question. And, uh, you will see that um, uh, there are some papers in classical and quantum gravity that deal with this problem just from a few years ago. There are several people that are studying spherically symmetric collapse in Newtonian gravity with different equations of state to look at things like critical phenomena and stuff like that. So it's academic, it's of academic interest, okay? But uh, it, people are still working on it. Okay, so um, now, if, can I, can I erase here? Mm -hmm. um, what, what I will actually start from in these lectures are uh, the black hole solutions of general relativity that we know. And uh, uh, for today, I'll be happy to focus on the Schwarzschild metric. So more in general, I'll consider a, a static spherically symmetric metric. And uh, um, I'll write it down in the form Okay, 
you all know this very well, f of r is in geometrical units nothing but 1 minus 2m over r. And uh, for the Schwarzschild metric, f of r is also equal to h of r. But if I work out the general problem where f and h are different from each other, I can describe things like, for example, the exterior of a non-rotating star. So for many of the problems that I'm going to work out, it will be useful to keep f and h different just to see what happens. Also, uh, if you keep f and h different from each other, with a trivial extension, you can consider things like black holes in higher dimensions, which I'm not going to do here, but you know, just keep it in the back of your mind. OK. So um, I will consider the Schwarzschild metric mostly today. Probably in the afternoon, I'll uh, uh, extend many of the things that I'm going to say this morning to the case of rotating black holes. But that would take me longer to write it on the board, and I don't want to use up too much of my time. So. Um, uh, Another thing that um, I should probably remind you now is that I'll mostly be interested in describing perturbations on the background of a Schwarzschild black hole, OK? And uh, um, after working out the particle problem this morning, I'll start working on scalar perturbations. Now, it's very useful, I think, to remind you that Whenever you have scalar perturbations on a spherical symmetric background, you can expand them in the uh, spherical harmonics. Now, you should all know this, but let me just remind you that uh, the spherical harmonics satisfy an equation of this form. where L and M are the standard indices. And uh, uh, this equation is called the uh, Legendre, generalized Legendre equation. Um, I know that all of you have seen this more than once. Uh, the only reason I'm uh, writing this down is that when you will see the Mathematica notebooks this afternoon, one of the key uh, tricks to simplify the equations that describe perturbations on top of a rotating black hole is to, first of all, tell your algebraic manipulation programs that you want to work with polynomials instead of trigonometric functions, because programs like Mathematica or Maple are not very good at manipulating trigonometric functions. So typically, you introduce something like chi equal cosine theta. And these are, are called rational polynomial coordinates. So if you take the, Schwar the Schwarzschild metric, for example, sine theta, you can write as 1 minus cosine squared theta. And uh, d theta, you can write it as you know, sine theta, d theta, whatever. Um, so you can write th this line element in terms of rational functions of chi. That's the key idea. For the Schwarzschild metric, this is not so important. But when you start handling things like the Kerr metric, it makes all the difference in the world. And uh, you can also rewrite this equation in terms of chi. And when you write it in terms of chi, uh, you'll get something like this. I'm going to write it down again. So this implies 1 minus chi squared p double prime, where a prime means a derivative with respect to chi now minus 2 chi p prime plus l l plus 1 minus m squared over 1 minus chi squared p equals 0. So the traditional uh, equation that describes the generalized the Legendre functions, these are not polynomials. The PLs are polynomials, but the PLMs are not polynomials, remember. This equation in terms of theta, through the definition of rational polynomial coordinates, can be rewritten in this way. And so when you do manipulations in Mathematica, whenever you see a second derivative of p with respect to chi, you can use this equation and replace it by first derivatives and p itself. And you can use this trick over and over to simplify your perturbation equations. Okay? 
So I just want you to keep this in mind because I'm going to use it over and over again. So uh, the other thing that I want to introduce now before I turn to uh, the description of particles is another trick that you may or may not know. If you don't know it, we'll go through it this afternoon. Uh, it's, for example, in uh, the Poisson Wheel book. I had to say, maybe I forgot to say it at the beginning, that another major motivation for me to do this is that I spent about one year teaching out of the Poisson Wheel book that I loved. I think it's awesome. But uh, the, the book skips completely for a, a conscious decision, compact objects. So they work with uh, Newtonian stars. They do all the classic problems in Chandrasekhar and so on. But they do not treat black holes in particular. And so I think that, you know, ideally, this complements very well the material that they cover in that book. Um, one of the main results that is used a lot in perturbation theory and in post-Newtonian theory as well is the fact that uh, if I try to write down the wave equation, there is a very useful trick that comes from the following observation. You can show that the Christoffel symbols with two indices repeated, gamma, mu, mu, beta, are given by 1 over square root of minus g, d mu of square root of minus g. Where, as usual, just let me introduce notation, g mu nu is the metric, g mu nu upstairs is the inverse of the metric, and g is the determinant. I'm taking the minus because this is the negative of the determinant of the metric, so it's positive. Um, the mu mu components of the Christoffel symbols are given by this relation. Now, if you have never seen this before, we can derive it this afternoon. How many of you know this relation? Yes, of course. Thanks. OK. So. Um, because of this relation, what you can do is, when you take things like this covariant derivative of a vector field, you can write it down as 1 over square root of minus g times um, the alpha So these are two results that I'm going to use over and over again. If you know them, good. If you don't know them and you want to spend 10 minutes this afternoon going over the derivation of this result, we can do it. Um, this is very important because uh, one of the first problems that we'll attack is the problem of writing down the wave equation for a scalar field. So uh, if you want to write down the wave equation for a scalar field, this is of course, something like this. So you see that it belongs to the same class of, uh, you know, covariant derivatives of a vector that I have just written down. And so you can write it as 1 over square root of minus g, the alpha, of square root minus g, the alpha upstairs, phi. OK? So keep this in mind. If you do not feel confident enough with these results, we can rederive them in the afternoon as part of the work problems. But uh, I'll use it for my prototype problem of describing the perturbations of a scalar field on top of a Schwarzschild background and then a Kerr background. Hmm? This result is very useful because if you think for a second, in the case of the Schwarzschild background, for example, you can do this problem with pen and paper now, because square root of minus g is just r squared sine theta. You can read it off the metric. Uh, so here you have four derivatives, dt dt, dr dr, d theta d theta, d phi d phi. So you have a total of four terms to compute. And this is the kind of thing you can do with pen and paper. And if you want, I can do it with pen and paper later. And uh, um, you can separate the wave equation very simply using this result, okay? 
So that's all you need. I can do it with pen and paper, like I said, but then I'll show you how to do it in Mathematica, because when we go to more complicated problems, it will not be so simple. So this was all background. What I really need for the moment this morning is the description of geodesics in the Schwarzschild background. So write down these things, and we'll see them again very soon. But uh, for now, I'll focus on the description of particles. And uh, my motivation for doing it is that uh, most of the physics of perturbed black holes and quasi-normal modes is related to the physics of the light ring. So you may or may not know what the light ring is. I'll, I'll remind you very soon. But it's basically the idea that if you consider light around a black hole, there you can put light in circular orbits around a black hole only down to a certain radius. And this radius is located for the Schwarzschild metric at 3m. This is a critical location that is clearly outside of the black hole event horizon that, as we have seen, is at 2m. But most of the physics of black hole perturbations takes place at the light ring, not at the event horizon. So the other reason why I want to focus on geodesics is that, like I said earlier, one of the model problems that I will describe is the problem of a particle falling into a black hole. We can consider several of these problems. The simplest is the one where the particle is falling head on into the black hole. And so now I'll set up the whole framework that you need to describe the geodesics. And I'll work out some of the key features that will be useful later to understand more about the properties of waves in the black hole horizon. So for now, I'll focus on particles. Particle motion. And I'll largely uh, follow a book by Chandra Sekhar in, uh, in my treatment of particle motion around black holes. So I'll start by um, reminding you that uh, the motion of particles in general relativity is uh, essentially um, free fall, OK? When, when we talk about free fall, what we really mean is that um, the motion of a particle in a gravitational wave, it, sorry, in a gravitational field, is um, motion that, uh, that, that is free from any other force. That's the key idea of uh, motion in general relativity. So what you want to do is um, you say that the trajectory of any particle is that trajectory that extremizes the proper interval between two events. So you introduce some affine parameter that you call lambda, which in the case of a massive particle is nothing but the proper time tau along the trajectory of the particle divided by the rest mass of the particle. This is true if your particle has a mass and not. Otherwise, you just use lambda to describe the motion of photons. And you say that uh, you introduce a Lagrangian density that for my own personal convenience I will define with a factor of two. And you say that um, this Lagrangian is basically the distance g mu nu dx mu dx nu between two space-time points. And you define a geodesic as the particular tra trajectory that minimizes this action. OK? That's, should, that should be very familiar to all of you. So you see that in the definition that I wrote down, OK? Can you still hear me? OK. So in the definition that I wrote down, uh, my Lagrangian density L is nothing but 1 half g mu nu x dot mu x dot nu, where obviously I have denoted the derivative with respect to the affine parameter by a dot. OK? 
And once you introduce this, you can write down your Euler-Lagrange equations as you do in your classical mechanics courses. And uh, what you find is that the Euler-Lagrange, let me write EL, the Euler-Lagrange equations for this Lagrangian are nothing but Right? I don't need to derive this, okay? You all have taken classical mechanics. And uh, um, here, of course, I have defined x dot alpha to be uh, dx alpha over d lambda, which I will also denote as p alpha, okay? Now, I can define, just like I always do in uh, classical mechanics, uh, um, canonical momentum associated with the coordinates, with, with the coordinates x mu uh, in the usual way. So I'll define it to be dl dx dot mu. And just look at the Lagrangian. This will be just g mu nu x dot nu or g mu nu p nu, right? So, um, now you can see very easily that varying this action gives you the geodesic equation. I can show it to you in a couple of lines, and uh, um, I'll just do it because it takes me two minutes, and uh, it will lead you to the geodesic equation. I will also use it as a reminder of what the Christoffel symbols are. So, if you do dl dx dot alpha, you get g mu alpha x dot mu, right? Then you do d d lambda of dl dx dot alpha. And this is just g mu alpha. So you have to take d d lambda of what I just wrote. And that's g mu alpha x double dot mu. I'm now differentiating the x and not the metric plus x dot, let's say, mu, uh -huh. um, we know when I contract the wrong indices. Huh? So uh, this is mu, plus x dot mu um, dg mu alpha d lambda. But this I can rewrite as, um, Right? Just by using the chain, uh, chain relation for derivatives. And then the LDX alpha is the other piece that I need, the right hand side of the Euler Lagrange equations. The LDX alpha is nothing but one half d alpha g mu nu x dot mu x dot nu. Okay, so if I put all these pieces together, you see that I get g mu alpha from here, g mu alpha x dot mu, double dot mu, plus x dot mu, x dot nu, d nu g mu alpha, minus one half. Okay? All of this equal to zero. But now I can take this guy, you see this guy is a symmetric tensor x dot mu x dot nu multiplied by something that is not symmetrized. So I can take this, symmetrize it, do d nu g nu alpha plus d mu g nu alpha and divide by two. No harm done. And uh, now you see that what I found is nothing but x 
as long as I define the Christoffel symbols in the usual way, that is gamma mu beta gamma equals one half g mu rho times d gamma g beta rho plus d beta g gamma rho minus d rho g beta gamma. Right? So, yes. Mu. Yes. I told you. <laughs> I'll keep doing this over and over, okay? Okay. So, um, but by the principle of minimal, of, I shouldn't say minimal, the principle of stationary action, there's a nice paper by Eric Poisson on this. It's not minimal, it depends. It's a subtle point sometimes. But the principle of stationary action applied to this Lagrangian gives us the geodesic equation. Okay, it's probably something that you all knew, but doesn't hurt um, reminding you. Okay, so now, what I want to do is take all of these ideas and apply them to the Schwarzschild metric. So let me get rid of this derivation because I'm not going to need it anymore. And what I will do is I'll focus on the Schwarzschild metric and find the key properties of the geodesics that I'm going to need later on to tackle all the problems I told you about. So now, the metric that I want to consider is this metric over here. I can take it to be generic. F and H are different functions. F is different from H. So now, my Lagrangian that I define here is, let me see what I want to write it. I don't need this, but I'll keep the Euler Lagrange equations. So let me write it in a different color because I'll keep using it. So I write that 2L is green, clear enough, can you read it? So 2L in my case is, again, G mu nu x dot mu x dot nu. And I can rewrite it as minus F T dot squared, right? Plus, h to the minus 1 r dot squared plus r squared right okay now from this lagrangian i can write down the canonical momenta associated to the coordinates so they will be PT, PT is just uh, DL DT dot, right? So what is it? Anybody? <laughs> Minus FT dot. And then I have PR which is h minus 1 r dot, by the same reasoning, right? Then I have p theta, and that's r squared theta dot. Then I have p phi, which is r squared sine squared theta phi dot. Okay? And now I have to write down the Euler-Lagrange equations that correspond to these momenta. And what I discover, well, is something that you probably knew all the way, is that because my Lagrangian is independent of two of the coordinates, there will be two conserved quantities in this space time. In particular, when I write down dPt d lambda, dPt d lambda, this is just the d lambda of dl dt dot, right? 
And this is equal by the Euler-Lagrange equations to the LDT. But the LDT is equal to zero because the Lagrangian does not depend on the coordinate T. Right? So I see immediately that PT must be conserved. And because it, mu it must be conserved, it follows that minus PT, let's say, which I remind you is FT dot, is equal to something that I will call the energy. Okay? Then, uh, by the same reasoning, I have that dp phi d lambda is equal to, same thing, dl d phi, but the Lagrangian does not depend on phi. So this is equal to zero. So I can define p phi, which is r squared sine squared theta phi dot, to be some other conserved quantity that I call the angular momentum of the particle. OK? And then I have the two remaining equations of motion that are dpr d lambda equals dl dr, and dp theta d, d lambda equals dl d theta. But I will not bother writing them down because what I can do is I can say that in a spherical symmetric space time, I can set my particle to be initially on the equatorial plane without any loss of generality because the space time is spherically symmetric. And I can set theta dot to be equal to zero at the initial time. So the particle stays there at all times. And uh, uh, so I'll focus on orbits that are equatorial. I'll set theta equal pi over two. And you see that my equations of motion at the end of all this game are that ft dot is equal to e. OK? Then I have r squared phi dot is equal to l, because I set theta equal pi over two here. And then I, I need a third equation for r dot. The third equation for r dot, I can get it uh, from the fact that the Lagrangian L is equal to a constant. And so um, I can write down that condition is basically equivalent to the, con the condition of the normalization of the four velocity, OK? And uh, that condition tells me that uh, e squared over f minus r dot squared over h minus l squared over r squared is equal to minus 2l, which I will call delta 1. And I'll set it to either 0 or 1. I can always set it to either 0 or 1 by appropriately rescaling the affine parameter lambda, which is a freedom I have. I can always multiply the affine parameter by whatever constant I want. And so you see that the condition of the constancy of the Lagrangian gives me an, a third differential equation for r dot that I can obtain by just taking r dot to the other side. And I write it down here. And that completes this kind of tedious derivation of the geodesic equations. But now you all remember where they come from. The third one tells you that uh, r dot squared is equal to some radial effective potential, which I define to be dr equals h times e squared over f minus l squared over r squared minus this constant delta 1. OK? So I'm done with the tedious part. Where I remind you that delta 1 is equal to 0 for photons and one for time-like geodesics. Okay? Red, 
red is not very good. You want me to rewrite it in a different color? I'm not going to use it anymore. Just tell me which colors do not work. So red, I used red because I thought it would stand out. But if you cannot see it, it's a very bad choice. OK. Yellow works better. OK. Next time, the important stuff will be in yellow. All right. So, um, but can you read it? Do you want me to write it down again? OK. So uh, now, the important thing is that, sorry? Was there a question in the back? Delta 1. It's just a constant. When I said the Lagrangian equal to a constant, that's basically the normalization of the four velocity. So if I have a photon, I set that equal to 0, and otherwise I set it equal to 1. OK? Um, so OK. Now, uh, this relation here is the one that is really important. Mm? Because you can now study qualitatively the motion of particles falling into your black hole, as you do in Newtonian mechanics. You just introduce an effective potential. You look at the turning points of the effective potential. The shape of the effective potential obviously depends on the energy of the particle and the angular momentum of the particle. Now, if I focus on the Schwarzschild metric, I can set f and h equal to 1 minus 2m over r. And so my effective potential becomes, let me write it in two ways. So one way, for example, is this. To highlight the Newtonian analogy, you divide by a factor 2 so that you really get the kinetic energy of the particle, 1 half r dot squared. And then you write this as some new energy, E calligraphic, that I define to be E squared over 2, right? You see here, H and F are equal. So what I'm doing is I di I'm dividing everything by 2. And E squared over 2, I call it the energy. And then I will have some potential here that I call V delta 1, where this V delta 1 is equal for the Schwarzschild metric to delta 1 okay notice also that i had defined this v delta 1 with a minus sign with respect to vr this is, for example, the notation used in the book by Carroll. So whenever you study the stability of geodesics, you have to remember that if a geodesic is stable in terms of the potential V delta 1, it's unstable in terms of the potential VR, because VR double prime is going to be minus V delta 1 double prime. Okay? So this is a matter of convention, and unfortunately, different books use different conventions. Um, or the other way you can write it is, of course, that r dot square is equal to e squared minus 2 v delta 1 of r. And uh, I can simplify this even further when I consider separate, separately the two cases of uh, time-like geodesics and photons. For a particle, um, I can introduce v particle equal to v delta 1. And that's going to be equal to 1 minus 2m over r, 1 plus l squared over r squared. Or um, for a photon, I can write that v of a photon is equal to 2v for delta 1 equals 0, divided by l squared. And this is equal to 1 over r squared, 1 minus 2m over r. So just to clarify, this notation here is the one used in Carroll's book. The notation that I'm using down here is the one used in Shapiro and Tukolsky. So one advantage of doing things in this way 
is that it makes it clear that for photons, the trajectory does not depend on both E and L. It only depends on the ratio of E and L. And this is a consequence of the equivalence principle. Okay? For photons, it doesn't matter. Um, all, all that matters is B, the impact parameter, which is the ratio of L over E. And you can see this in different ways. For example, you can take your affine parameter lambda multiplied by L, and L disappears completely from the equations. Okay? So you can now uh, sketch the effective potentials. And this is finally the point where I wanted to get. And what you see is that Consider, for example, the case of a time-like geodesic, a particle, what I will call a particle from now on, okay? For a particle, the shape of the effective potential depends on uh, L. So suppose that you fix here a horizontal line corresponding to energy equal one. That would be a particle that falls from infinity with energy equal to its own rest mass. I should have said that what I called D at the very beginning was the energy per unit rest mass of the particle. Mm -hmm. So if I take the value one here, I will see that. When L over M is greater than four, the shape of the effective potential looks something like this. There is a critical case that corresponds to L over M equal four. Which, now that I know that yellow is the right color, I'm drawing in yellow, okay? So this is L over M equal four. And this is the critical case. This is the critical case because you see that a particle which has angular momentum L over M equal four is such that if I let it fall from infinity, huh, if it has energy just slightly higher than one, it will fall. If it has energy just slightly less than one, it will not. If it falls from rest, something weird is going to happen and we'll see what happens, okay? And then I can have, um, lower energies, uh, sorry, lower values of L for which the potential is going to look like this. And at some point, the local minimum and the local maximum will merge. And that will have only an inflection point. And uh, this critical value corresponds to L over M equal two square root of three. These are all things that you can check analytically by just taking derivatives of the potentials, you know, doing stuff like that. And below that, you know, it will be boring. It will be more of the same. So these are the shapes of effective potentials for particles. If you take a photon, like I said before, for a photon, there is only one effective potential that matters. Because I can, oh, here, what well, on the x-axis I had r over m, r measured in units of the mass of the black hole. Here I do the same, R over M, and V of the photon is up here. And I have an effective potential that looks something like this. So now, the peak of this effective potential is at three. Hmm? And the outcome of throwing a particle onto the black hole depends only on B, on the impact parameter. If the impact parameter is such that one over B squared is greater than one over 27 M squared, then the particle will fall. If it's smaller than this, then what's going to happen is that the particle will fall in it will have a radial turning point, and then it will go back out. The critical value is the one for which B is exactly equal to 27 M squared. So B squared is 27 M squared. So B is three square root of three M. And that's the, the infamous 
light ring, okay? It's this critical orbit such that if I shoot a photon at the black hole with exactly that impact parameter, it will keep orbiting indefinitely on a circular orbit around the black hole. But as you can see from the shape of this effective potential, that orbit is unstable. Give it a little kick and this bundle of photons will either fall into the black hole or disperse to infinity. So what we're going to study next is how this bundle of photons either falls in or disperses to infinity, because as we will see, this is very tightly connected to perturbations induced on the black hole by massless fields, scalar, electromagnetic, or gravitational, okay? All of them can be understood as massless particles, and so their behavior is going to be determined uniquely by that effective potential that you see over there. So let me point out a couple of features of these uh, orbits. One is that circular orbits, let me write this in uh, orange, circular orbits They're characterized by what? Many voices, but all of them are too... F <laughs> speak up, be loud. Eh? R dot? Is that the only thing? R dot is equal to zero, you're right. Is this the only condition I want? Is there anything else I have to require? This is a classic mistake. Huh? <laughs> is there anything else I need to require? So R double dot has to be equal to zero as well. Mm. So a circular orbit is characterized by these two conditions. Okay? R is, is a constant. And if I take yet another derivative, it stays constant, okay? So uh, these two conditions, if you look at this equation, they correspond to um, R dot equals zero means that uh, VR is equal to zero. Where, where is the one in terms of VR? Well, here. R dot equals zero means that VR is equal to zero. And R double dot equals zero means that VR prime is also equal to zero. So this condition is VR equals zero. And this other condition is that VR prime is equal to zero, okay? Now, if you write them down explicitly, you will see for the Schwarzschild metric that this tells you L squared R minus three M is equal to delta one M R squared. Or, if you want, it gives you L in terms of delta 1. You know, you can solve for L. Now, um, the second relation, sorry, this was VR prime equals 0. And uh, VR equals 0, sorry that I mixed them up. VR equals 0 tells you that T squared is equal to F delta 1 plus L squared over R squared, which, you know, you can solve for L from here, plug it into the second one, and with a little bit of manipulation, you see that this gives you delta 1 R F squared over R minus 3M. Okay? So these are telling you a few things. For example, this condition, delta 1 is positive, mr squared or 0. mr squared is positive, L squared is obviously positive. So you see that circular orbits, VR prime equals 0, can exist only when uh, R is greater or equal than 3M, 
right? They exist only for R greater or equal than 3M. And in the case where you have photons, delta 1 is equal to 0, they only exist at R equal 3M, which is what we found by looking at the effective potential for photons. So everything matches, OK? Um, also, you can compute VR double prime, and you will see that VR double prime is minus 2 delta 1 m r minus 6m, this is a parenthesis, sorry, r minus 6m over r cube r minus 3m. So you see that when r is greater than 6m, it's also greater than 3m, so vr double prime is negative. Okay? Between 6m and 3m, vr double prime changes sign. This is why 6m is called the ISCO, the innermost stable circular orbit. All the orbits of time-like particles that have radii between 3m and 6m are unstable. And also we saw that for photons, that regime shrinks in, in such a way that you only have circular orbits at r equal 3m and they are all unstable. Okay? So for photons in particular, this is what I want to keep you in, to... Okay. This is what I want you to keep in mind at the end of all this discussion. If you have photons, everything below the light ring is going to fall into the black hole. And everything above the light ring will escape. So that's the surface that matters, not the event horizon. When you shine light at a black hole, when all these people that do the event horizon telescope talk about imaging a black hole, they're not talking about imaging the event horizon. They're talking about imaging the light ring because that's what you're seeing. And if your black hole is rotating, the shape of this light ring is going to change in certain ways, but it's always the light ring that you're looking at. And now there's a lot of papers going back and forth about whether the same is true with gravitational waves as well. Are we only seeing the light ring or are we seeing the event horizon when we see a ring down from merging black holes? And we're seeing the light ring, obviously, <laughs> okay? For this reason, the event horizon comes in because it enforces specific boundary conditions on the perturbations. If you have a black hole, at r equal to m, everything has to fall in. There's nothing else that can happen. But your perturbations are all localized at the light ring, okay? Um, there's another thing that I want to give you explicitly, which is the following argument. So I have shown you here and I can show it more explicitly that it's in the notes, so go ahead and do your derivatives, but I wrote them down explicitly in the notes, that if you take a time-like particle with energy one, then the critical value for the angular momentum is L over m equal four. And, uh, um, okay, so that corresponds in R here to R equal four m. Maybe that's another value that I should mark. This is four, okay, for a particle of energy one. Um, what happens if you take a particle with energy equal infinity? How you, do you determine that this is the critical orbit? You do it in the following way. Well, you can write down that for a photon, r dot squared is equal to e squared minus f s squared over r squared. So this is general, okay? It's not for a photon. This is just the, the general um, form of the effective potential. E squared over R cubed times R cubed minus R F B squared, where I define B to be L over E. So now you see that the condition for which uh, you can have turning points whenever our dot vanishes. Now, the vanishing of our dot corresponds to the vanishing of this cubic. This is a cubic because f is one minus two m over r. So you have r cube and then terms that are 
R or, you know. Um, so uh, when, when does the, or constants. So uh, when does the cubic vanish? Well, you know from uh, your uh, algebra that cubics can have at most three real roots, okay? If you study this cubic, I have the argument again in the notes, what you find out is that just by simple properties of cubics, this cubic always has at least one negative real root. So there are only two possibilities. Either the other two roots are complex and conjugate, or they are, they are both real. The critical case is when the two roots, the two complex conjugate roots, coalesce on the real axis. That critical case corresponds to taking this round parenthesis and setting its derivative equal to zero, right? So if you do that and you solve, now you have a quadratic, you solve that quadratic for R, and you find that the critical value of B corresponds to uh, 27, 3 square root of 3, and the corresponding value of R corresponds to 3. This is how you can find analytically the location of the light ring. Okay? It's very simple. Okay. So, now I told you everything I wanted to tell you about geodesics in the Schwarzschild metric. This was all in preparation of what I'm going to do next. Where things get interesting, and uh, probably where I will start saying things that you haven't seen before, is uh, when I start studying the stability of these geodesics. Okay? So, uh, if you have taken any course on uh, dynamical systems, you have probably heard uh, something called the Lyapunov exponent. How many of you have at least heard about it before? Okay, and kind of, okay, maybe one in three. So I'll tell you what they are. The idea is quite simple. Let me erase here. I don't need this stuff anymore. So think of uh, the set of geodesic equations that I wrote down here as a set of linear, sorry, of first order equations for either the coordinates or the canonical momenta. Any Hamiltonian system is a first order system in time, right? You have derivative in time of each of the coordinates equal to something, and derivative in time of each of the canonical momenta equal to something. So if you think of these generalized coordinates, take a vector of all the coordinates q mu, and then a vector of all the generalized momenta p mu, put them all together, call them big X. These are all of your coordinates in phase space for an n-dimensional um, manifold, there will be two n of them, right? So take all of these coordinates and write down your dynamical system in the general form that is always valid, that dxi dt is equal to, let's say, hi of xj. I can always do this, okay? I'm writing each of the coordinates or momenta the equation of motion for that coordinate or momentum as d coordinate or momentum equal to some function of the qi's and pi's, okay? Now the idea is, suppose that I have a solution of the equations of motion, xi of t, the whole vector, and I kick it a little bit. For example, I take my photon, that's what I'm interested in, I'm, I'm always going back to that, I'm taking the light ring. The light ring will be a one-dimensional manifold because all I'm interested in is R and PR. And I give it a little kick. What happens? Well, as in all the cases where you want to study small deviations from a known solution, what you can do is linearize. You take your solution of the equations of motion, xi of t, and you say, let's suppose that I have a perturbation that looks like xi plus delta xi, and then I linearize in the delta xi's. And what you get is that d delta xi dt 
is equal to, guess what, dHi dxj, evaluated at your background trajectory, xi of t, times delta xj of t. This is a j, okay? I'm just linearizing. So, this is a sum over all the j's. I'm using the Einstein summation convention. And I'm just taking the derivative of hi with respect to all of the coordinates times delta xj, okay? And I will introduce a definition and I will call kij of t the matrix that I obtain by taking dhi dxj, okay? That's in an n-dimensional phase space, a 2n by 2n matrix. Now, you can verify easily, and I will ask you to do it during the lunch break or during Satya's lecture, so you get distracted, <laughs> that your general solution is uh, delta xi of t equals lij of t times delta xj of zero, where the matrix Lij satisfies this equation. Lij of t equals k i m t l m j of t with Lij of zero equal delta ij. So you see that I need this condition in order for the differential equation to be satisfied at time t equals zero. Right? Uh, and uh, this is an evolution equation for this matrix cell. So now I will define the Lyapunov exponents as the eigenvalues that I obtain when I diagonalize this matrix Lij. In particular, the principal Lyapunov exponent is defined as lambda equal the limit as t goes to infinity of 1 over t log of Ljj of t over Ljj of 0. So basically the procedure is the following. You can check that this is a solution by just plugging it into the left hand side and compare it to the right hand side, it's very simple. But the idea behind all of this is that if you are taking a small deviation around your solution xi of t, for small times, your solution will deviate exponentially from the exact trajectory, if that trajectory is unstable, on a time scale which is given by lambda. You see that e to the lambda t times lambda jj of zero is lambda jj of t. So you're taking this matrix, you diagonalize it, you look for the eigenvectors and uh, eigenvalues. The lowest of these eigenvalues is the one that is going to give you the dominant growth time for the perturbation. And so that will tell you how fast neighboring geodesics in our case, neighboring trajectories, diverge from each other when I give them a small kick. That's the idea, okay? Now, what I want you to do this afternoon is to work out explicitly the diagonalization for the case of a photon orbit. It's done in the notes, but I knew when uh, I started preparing this class that I wouldn't have time to do it on the blackboard. So what I will ask you to do this afternoon is to apply this formalism using the geodesic equations that I wrote down, dl dpr in particular, you know, the dpr d lambda and the dr d lambda are going to be the ones that matter for photon orbits. You will have a two-dimensional 
uh, phase space because you only have the coordinate R and the PR momentum. And you can, uh, you can all diagonalize a two by two matrix. And you will find a very interesting result that I will quote now because it's related to perturbations induced by waves, not by particles. The result that you will find is this. So the idea is that you want to take, let me erase over here. The calculation goes in the following way. This calculation, by the way, was first done by, as far as I know, by Neil Cornish and Jana Levin, um, who were interested in the properties of chaos around black holes. Because these Lyapunov exponents are intimately related to whether you have uh, chaotic orbits or not, okay? Um, so what you want to do is you take your, if you remember, this is what PR is, just by taking the derivative of the uh, Lagrangian with respect to R dot. You can write this equation as R dot equals um, HPR, right? And then you have a second equation, which is DPR d lambda equals DLDR. Okay, so this is now my x dot i equals h i of x j dynamical system. What you want to do is you say set r equal to r plus delta r and set pr equal to, let's say, r zero. r zero is the orbit at 3m. And you set pr equal to pr zero plus delta PR. Then you plug everything in, you linearize, and you get a two by two matrix. You solve for the eigenvalues, and you will see that the eigenvalues come in couples. So you get that this lambda is equal to, the matrix will look something like this, zero, K1, K2, zero. You can see it already from the structure of these things, right? So you write down K1 and K2, you diagonalize and you find that your eigenvalues are square root of K1, K2, right? And then if you write it down explicitly, you will see that this eigenvalue will be, when all is said and done, the square root of VR double prime over two T dot squared which you can also rewrite as one over two pi square root of two phi dot squared over the R double prime. In both cases, you see that you have something which is positive and the R double prime. So as you would expect, whenever the R double prime changes sign, you go from having stable orbits to having unstable orbits. But this is telling you something more because it doesn't just tell you whether the orbits are stable or unstable. It also tells you the time scale over which the orbits will diverge from their unstable position. Mm? And in particular, you will find that for the Schwarzschild metric, this can be written as one over square root of two, square root of minus the radius of the circular orbit squared over FC, FC means one minus two m over r evaluated at the circular orbit. Second derivative with respect to r star squared, I will explain in a minute what this is, of f over r dot squared. All of these evaluated at the radius of the circular orbit. Where r star is defined for a general spherically symmetric metric as dr dr star equals hf power one half. That dr star, I introduce it now because it will play a very, very important role when I start describing waves, not particles. 
Um, I define it in a way that is too general for what I'm going to need later, but this just to show you that I can do it for any static spherical asymmetric space-time. So the analysis that I have done applies equally well to the exterior of a non-rotating star. Or, if you like to be fancy and you like that sort of stuff, to the exterior of a higher dimensional Tangerlini black hole, which is the higher dimensional generalization of the Schwarzschild metric. You can study geodesics outside any static spherical asymmetric space-time in this way. And this lambda always gives you the time scale over which orbits that are unstable will diverge from their corresponding background solution. Okay, keep it in mind. The reason this is also important is that when I will study perturbations induced by, say, scalar waves or electromagnetic waves or gravitational waves, it will turn out that the effective potential has a shape very, very similar to this. What it does, now, this is not the potential for particles, it's the potential for the scattering of waves of a black hole. I will introduce the R star coordinate. In terms of the R coordinate, everything terminates at 2m. But in terms of the R star coordinate, I can go all the way to minus infinity, as you will see later. And what happens is that your effective potential is done something like this. It decays at both infinity and minus infinity in terms of the R star coordinate. It has a peak at 3m, exactly 3m for scalar waves and very close to 3m for electromagnetic and gravitational waves. When I say very close, I mean 3.01, okay? And uh, the perturbations induced by waves can be described as a scattering problem over this blue potential. So the idea is that you will have a quantum mechanical problem where you let waves go in. Some of these waves will be reflected and some will be transmitted by your effective potential. And if you think of it in terms of a WKB analysis, all that matters is the behavior of the potential around the maximum. So you will see that the behavior of the scattering of waves of a black hole is very, very similar to the behavior of the geodesics at the 3M orbit. And I will make this analogy more precise as I go on. I'm out of time, so for this morning we're done. This afternoon we're going to spend most of our time doing the scalar wave equation, going through the mathematical notebooks and working out these few problems that I gave you this morning. Okay? All right.